Well, good morning. Um, I get, my talk is actually a very natural follow-on to, uh, to Rick's. We decided to do this as a tag team kind of talk. So I'm going to pick up in 1980 and take you to the present. But I also have a disclaimer. Um, I'm going to really be focusing on sort of basic research on tropical cyclones. And I won't be talking about modeling just because there's not enough time and other people here who are much more expert than me on that subject will be talking about it, nor will I be talking specifically about the enormous uh, progress in forecasting, which I expect you'll hear about from others. So the first message I have for you is that this period of time, 1980 to the present, has been a time of enormous um, uh, progress and interest in hurricanes. And um, I decided to make this little graph. It is simply the number of peer-reviewed publications with the words hurricane or tropical or phrase tropical cyclone in their title according to the uh, meteorological and geoastrophysical abstracts from 1980 to the present. And you can see this enormous ramp up in publications on hurricanes, so I think reflecting a very large increase in interest. Now, you might be wondering, you know, what's driving this big increase in interest? And those of you with some understanding of hurricane climatology, North Atlantic hurricane climatology, might see a little bit of a relationship there. Well, I decided to go and do a little bit of theoretical work on the subject, and I actually have come up with this <laughs> idea that the time rate of change of peer-reviewed publications is proportional to the excess of North Atlantic tropical cyclones over six <laughs> raised to the five-halves power, and then minus uh, sort of a decay uh, with a six-year time scale, which I regard as the sort of average attention span of scientists. So. <laughs> If we, uh, if we take that theory and compare it to the data, <laughs> it's a red line. And actually, that is a calcu that's a legitimate calculation using that. I'm not pulling the wool over your eyes on that. Yeah, that's, that's an actual solution of the equation. <laughs> now, I started in 1980. I started in, that was the initial condition. So that's another possible PhD research topic for someone to <laughs> All right, so um, this is going to be a somewhat selective uh, and, and perhaps biased account of what I regard as major developments, and I'm sure I missed some. You know, I, I tried to think through them. And uh, I would say that beginning around sometime in the 1980s, it was actually a fairly decisive rejection of the idea of CISC. And I'm, I'll come back and talk about that. I regard that as kind of a backward step, which often does happen in science. And a return to the older views um, of the 1950s of Klein, Schmidt, and Real, and I agree entirely with Rick that there was an awful lot that was understood already by the 1950s about tropical cyclones. Um, we, uh, lots of people worked on theories of potential intensity beginning in the 1980s. Uh, a fairly conclusive demonstration of the importance of ocean feedback. Now, as Rick mentioned, this idea has a long history. It wasn't new to this period. But the models became good enough during this time to actually start showing these feedbacks. A refinement of the theory of tropical cyclone motion. Uh, very nice observational work doing lots of things. Um, for example, quantifying the structure of vertical uh, motions in hurricanes. Uh, and this uh, resulted from a refinement and uh, technological progress in, in various kinds of observational techniques and all the hard work that was done at places like HRD and, and doing hurricane missions. Uh, the identification um, of, uh, and this actually has a longer pedigree as well, of eddy fluxes. Um, and I've termed them here eddy fluxes of potential vorticity, although the original work really concentrated on angular momentum, very similar in many ways, especially in the outflow layer as a influence on intensity change. Further quantification of the effects of vertical wind shear um, then we saw a lot of research on sort of going more to the climate direction, the effects of ENSO, particularly on northern hemispheric uh, tropical cyclones, the modulation of tropical cyclones by other phenomena like the Madden Julian oscillation, a reemergence of interest in vortex Rossi waves. Again, this has a history going back to the 1950s. There are a lot, several papers on vortex Rossi waves. The idea got dropped and then picked up again much later. You see this a lot, I think, in, in this subject. It's kind of interesting. Uh, progress in understanding tropical cyclone genesis. I, might, I toyed with the idea of 
putting the adjective slow on the slow progress. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near there. And I'll say something about that in my concluding remarks. Um, accelerated research in extratropical transition. Again, this phenomenon was known a long time ago. But I think we made a lot of progress uh, since 1980 understanding the physics behind it. Um, importance of surface effects, the effects of waves and variable wave drag on hurricanes is really just coming to the fore now. The importance of the transition, the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, sea spray effects, um, those are all fairly modern developments. Um, identification of the phenomenon of superintensity and uh, uh, very recently I think an understanding of that has emerged. Uh, and then the development of the field of paleotempestology, um, which has been a big leg up in understanding the relationship between hurricanes and climate. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, the emergence of research on long-term climate effects on hurricanes during this period. And finally, um, and Greg had mentioned this a minute ago, the identification of physical and biological feedbacks, with the biological being really recent, uh, back on climate from hurricanes. And so we're beginning to understand that this interaction may very well be a two-way street, uh, just as Greg said. Now, I don't have time in my short talk to review all of these things, and I'm sure I've missed some things, but I wanted to, to give you some selective uh, highlights. So uh, this is an interesting thing, I think, from an historical perspective. The, the earliest clear statement that I can find in literature, and I don't mean to say that I've done a very thorough search, is from a paper written in German uh, in 1951 by Ernst Kleinschmidt, later translated into English. I don't think it's widely available, but if you'd like the paper, I can send it to you. Uh, it was translated, I think, by the UK Met Office years ago. And what Kleinschmidt said very clearly in this paper is the heat removed from the sea by the storm is the basic energy source of the typhoon. In and I think we all agree that that's true today. In comparison to it, the latent heat of water vapor, which the air carries it with it from the outside, plays no more than a secondary role. And that may seem a little bit odd to you, because from a strictly water budget point of view, there's a lot more latent heat release due to the imported water vapor than there is from the ocean. Yet, nevertheless, Kleinschmidt's statement is true, because most of that imported water vapor, maybe all of it, is used simply to raise the potential and internal energy of air. It doesn't contribute to the production of kinetic energy in the store. And, um, Charney and Eliasson uh, came up with the idea of CISC and, and published it in 1964. Uh, you can read the whole paper. Uh, it's proposed that the cyclone develops by a kind of secondary instability in which existing cumulus convection is augmented in regions of low level convergence and quenched in regions of low level divergence. So the, the notion that was introduced here was that hurricanes resulted from an organized release a pre-existing conditional instability. What's notable about that paper is that the idea of real and Kleinschmidt was really just not there in the paper at all. There was no importance attached to surface fluxes except maybe to keep the atmosphere stoked with conditional instability. And when I, and Jill Charney was my advisor, by the way, and a wonderful man and a great scientist, but sometimes great scientists make great mistakes, and I think this is one of them. I think it was a mistake. I think it was just plain wrong. And one of the telling things is there's nothing about this theory that wouldn't work over land. Okay? Tropical cyclones should develop over land if this is a correct theory. So there was something a little odd about that. Now, because of the fantastic measurements that started to be made in hurricanes in the 50s and 60s, we, ha we were able to do these wonderful uh, plots like this cross-section through Hurricane Inez in 1966 made with aircraft observations showing you the distribution of equivalent potential temperature. Uh, the center of the storm is in the center of the diagram. It goes out 50 nautical miles, and Inez is a very small hurricane. And actually, I was a kid in Florida when this happened, and I got the day off from school because of this storm. So it registers as a very positive event in my memory. Um, <laughs> But you can see this, this, you know, this huge increase in entropy, uh, air presumably flowing in here. 
um, which Kleinschmidt and Real had identified as the thing that's really driving the storm. And it's obviously why storms decay, almost start to decay almost as soon as they move over dry land. All right. Um, and we, I think we, Real had started to work on the energy cycle and published a very nice paper that Rick cited in 1960 about that. In the 80s and 90s, I think we got a better handle quantitatively on that. Now, the fact that I think that maybe the last nail in the coffin of CISC is this set of very nice simulations done with an axisymmetric model by um, Aga Smith-Rovic, uh, who uh, works with Olivier Paul Wee and Steve Gardner at Princeton and NYU, in which she showed that it's perfectly possible to have a dry hurricane. So I think the notion that cumulus convection is necessary for a hurricane depends on your philosophy. Now, how do you get a dry hurricane? Uh, obviously, if you just turn off latent heat release and you start with a tropical atmosphere, nothing's going to happen. But that's not a fair experiment. The fair experiment is to run the whole environment into the situation that environment would be if there weren't any latent heat release. So what do you have if you turn off latent heat? You have dry radiative convective equilibrium as the characteristic state of the tropical atmosphere. You have a dry diabatic lapse rate up to a lower tropopause, and then you have a, you know, isothermal stratosphere. That's the state that the tropical atmosphere would exist in if you didn't have latent heat release. And um, what you see on the left is a profile of wind speed and radial wind speed vertical motion, so tangential radial vertical motion, in a simulation of a dry hurricane. You just start with a state in which, the, again, the surface is not in thermodynamic equilibrium with the atmosphere. You have a temperature jump in this case. That's the disequilibrium. It's perfectly fine to have a dry hurricane. Works perfectly well. No cumulus convection. No contradiction. Hurricanes are surface flux driven phenomena. They're not, convection is necessary for the same weight that a counterweight is necessary in an elevator, but they're not the drivers of the hurricane. And potential intensity theory uh, got to the point where we could make quantitative analyses of what potential intensity distributions are. For example, in the present climate, this is showing the annual maximum value of potential intensity around the world. Now, the ocean interaction uh, really sort of took off in the 80s. And I think this was um, thanks to the fact that computers became powerful enough to, to run fairly high resolution coupled simulations. This is a, uh, just a satellite infrared photograph taken shortly after the passage of Hurricane Eduard along this black line. And you can clearly see this cold wake. How cold? Well, uh, you know, up to 5 degrees C lower than the uh, normal state of the tropical ocean. So there's a lot of stirring up of cold water. This is mixing. Very little of this cold wake can be explained by evaporation. And for the average hurricane, it has a pronounced negative feedback on the intensity. For slow moving hurricanes, it can have a, be a really big negative feedback on intensity. All of that was uh, fairly well established. And I think we now understand that if we want to make good quantitative forecasts of hurricane intensity, we have to do it with coupled models, or at least somehow take into account the uh, feedback from the ocean. Uh, I had a movie to play of Katrina, but I forgot to load the actual movie on here, so I have to skip that one. But there's some very nice uh, information out there. Um, uh, this is one numerical simulation I will show of a, a axisymmetric hurricane moving uh, right to left across an idealized ocean. This is a 3D ocean model showing the uh, change in the mixed layer depths, which are colored there, and the surface currents, which are black arrows, where you see this very beautiful near inertial response in the hurricane wake. And it's that near inertial response, shears associated with that generate turbulence at the base of the mixed layer, which mixes cold water upward, deepens the mixed layer. Um, it's all a very nice piece of uh, physics. And I think it's one of the great accomplishments in hurricane science. We also understood that environmental interactions of all kinds are important. Uh, Going back into the 60s, it was recognized by groups at Florida State, for example, that uh, eddy fluxes are important. And here's from a paper by John Molinari and colleagues showing cross-sections of PV through uh, Tropical Storm Danny. This is a time sequence, I think, separated by 12 hours, red 
left, right, top, bottom, showing an upper level disturbance approaching the PV anomaly of Danny and so forth and beginning to interact with it. When you superpose PV anomalies, you extract energy from the background flow and uh, increase the disturbance energy. Um, here is a nice uh, composite showing the evolution of uh, velocity potential at 200 millibars in the tropics. So you're reading longitude left to right, latitude from uh, 30 south to 30 north, and going forward in time from top to bottom at five-day intervals, showing the velocity potential associated with an MJO event, Madden-Julian oscillation. And the little O's that you see there are um, locations of tropical cyclogenesis. So I think you can see that it's favored in the sort of convergent, low-level convergent phase, up high-level divergent phase of the MJO. So the recognition that ENSO, MJO, and other phenomena modulate tropical cyclones has been uh, an interesting research accomplishment with obvious implications for forecasting. Uh, there are lots of experiments conducted in this time frame on trying to understand genesis. Uh, this, is, this is an experiment that Dave Raymond and I organized, so I happen to have slides for it, uh, showing sort of a critical transition in what proved to be Hurricane Guillermo, what developed in Hurricane Guillermo. You're seeing uh, 975 millibars directly measured uh, uh, temperature and um, winds from the aircraft, showing this cold pool, all right? Um, every time we seem to look at details of tropical cyclones, and this is also known by Herb Real, by the way, if you read his papers from the 50s, he almost always says, before you have a tropical cyclone, you have a cold core disturbance. And that kind of got forgot, but when we started looking at it, by God, this is what we see. It begins as a mesocyclone at mid-levels, all right, if it's quasi-balanced, it's cold core at low levels. And what happens, at least what seemed to happen in this case, is probably because of surface fluxes, you've got a, a, a warming, a local warming within that cold core. So a little bit like Russian dolls, so warm core disturbance develops in a cold core disturbance, and that is what becomes the hurricane. And I think one can make a very interesting argument that except for cases of strong baroclinic forcing, uh, most tropical cyclones really do have to thermodynamically go through a stage of cold core. Uh, and if, in fact, if you put a cold core mesocyclone into a numerical model as your initial condition, it's very easy to spin up a hurricane starting from that condition. Um, I think I'll skip this, but we sort of came up with a kind of schematic of what we thought was going on in this case in which the mesoscale dynamics, the evaporation of stratiform rain, the spin-up of a mesoscale cyclone aloft, things that you see all the time over land, in addition to over the ocean, are really critical components leading to the genesis of tropical cyclones. Now, I mentioned to um, this field um, in geology called paleotempestology, which uses a variety of techniques to detect the presence of hurricanes in the geological record, and is beginning to produce uh, interesting records of tropical cyclones going back not 100 years, like the best track data does, if you believe it, but going back thousands of years. And um, one of the techniques is making use of the fact that storm surges wash sand into inland lagoons and uh, marshes. And if you go out into the lagoon, if you fill up a rubber raft with uh, graduate students and a cheap coring device, take cores down here, uh, you can see the sand layers and you can radiocarbon date the surrounding mud and get an idea. So here is a core from Massachusetts, actually. So this is depth in the core and the contouring is the grain size in the core. So where you see a uh, high grain size, it's interpreted to be overwash deposits, mostly from hurricanes. So you can get a record, a long-term record of hurricanes and so forth. And then more recently, in this decade, uh, we've started to understand that things like uh, hurricane power is correlated with sea surface temperature in certain parts of the world anyway. This is Atlantic hurricane power in blue uh, versus Atlantic uh, summertime sea surface temperature in green. Uh, people have known for decades that there's a relationship between sea surface temperature and hurricanes, but this particular metric Hurricane power seems especially well correlated. By the way, if you update that, 
to 2009, the correlation actually improves, although it goes down at the end of the record, the actual correlation improves. And that this may have something to do with much larger scale changes. So this is the record of northern hemispheric temperature change, um, which you see in green versus the sea surface temperature in the so-called main development region of the tropical Atlantic. And uh, going back 150 years or so, and they're pretty well correlated. Um, so that would suggest that some of the oscillations we've seen on these time scales in the Atlantic are related to at least hemispheric scale phenomena. Um, there has been progress, for example, in understanding genesis by going back to Bill Gray's genesis index um, and sort of updating it a little bit and noting that, in fact, you can make very good predictions of the spatial distribution of genesis by just knowing the large scale flow. And this is one of the interesting things that has to be reconciled in coming up with a good theory of genesis. As Rick mentioned, and as everyone knows, uh, hurricanes invariably develop out of pre-existing disturbances. There's a tempting piece of, of illogic that follows from that in most people's minds, including mine. And that is, if you took away the disturbances, you wouldn't have any hurricanes. And that turns out to be, in fact, illogical. And I think it's shown by this diagram, which is an estimate of global genesis distributions from uh, an index that's like Gray's index. It makes no account whatsoever of the, of the strength uh, or type of pre-existing disturbance in the environment. You can predict uh, the, the general spatial and temporal patterns of genesis perfectly well without knowing the climatology of easterly waves, for example. So there's something a little mysterious there that needs to be worked out. So as Rick did, I'd like to uh, sort of conclude this um, with a look to the future. And um, there's something I meant to put in here, I see that I didn't put in there, is that uh, we, we all think that intensity prediction is uh, something that we can make rapid progress on. But I would qualify that. And I'd say that there's a basic piece of research which largely hasn't been done, which is the basic predictability of hurricane intensity. We actually don't know what that is, I would argue. The few studies I've seen are rather pessimistic about that. Right? So it may not be true that better models, even perfect models, are going to get you there if the predictability limits are pessimistic. Now, I don't know that they're pessimistic, but I would like to say to all of you, particularly the young people here who are look, looking at a research topic, this is something we've got to look at. We've got to look at the basic science of predictability applied to the problem of hurricane intensity and ask ourselves, what's realistic to expect? What should we be working toward? We should not be throwing lots of money and resources at making a six-day intensity prediction if, if the predictability studies then uh, or have told you that this is just not realistic. Yep. Okay, I'm almost done. So I think we will all agree tropical cyclogenesis is, um, is something I still regard as a largely unsolved problem. We have made progress on it. We're not there. It's a great research problem. Um, but yes, I did say that I did actually have a bullet point for basic predictability of intensity. <coughs> Shear effects on tropical cyclones is another area where I think there's been some very interesting progress, which I didn't have time to review. But I don't think any of the people who worked on this would argue we're there yet in understanding this. Uh, super intensity and, and the uh, effects of radial turbulent diffusion. There's a very nice work that's done here at, uh, in, in this group at NCAR which point to the real importance of turbulence in hurricanes, small-scale turbulence. All of boundary layer theory is predicated on looking at vertical fluxes. And of course, those are important in hurricanes too. There's not that much work done and not very much understood about radial fluxes. But in the eye walls of hurricanes, where you have extremely sharp radial gradients of quantities, uh, it's been demonstrated, at least to my satisfaction by the work done here, that these turbulent fluxes are really important and need to be understood. Um, and of course, um, as Rick also mentioned, the climate effects on tropical cyclones, their tracks, intensity, frequency, and so on, 
are going to be, no doubt, they are a hot topic now. I think they'll remain so for a while. And the uh, possible feedbacks, both physical and biological, I didn't say anything to you about the biological stuff. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, the feedback effects of tropical cyclones on climate uh, is something that I think is, is an extremely interesting problem and, and would strongly encourage people who may have an interest in that to pursue it. I'll leave it at that, thanks.